the most uh, maybe it started. We lost Obi Brown, but I think we've located him. He's sort of sauntering down the hall or something. I don't know. Um, I'll talk to you just a little bit about kind of how we'd like this afternoon to work. And we hope that this becomes a very benefit. Come on up here, Obi. <laughs> We hope it's a very beneficial part of what we're doing because we find out that a lot of times when we uh, conduct seminars and workshops that one of the things that probably happens more often than not is people say they get more out of talking to us in between sessions and after sessions. So we hope this becomes the talking to us between and after sessions by making this a very collaborative kind of thing where we can talk about the specific concerns that you have. As you're doing that, let me encourage you to try to be as succinct as possible because just like you have issues and battles that you're fighting or particular questions that you have, so do all of your friends and compatriots in the room. So we want to share the wealth as much as possible. All four of us will not address every issue. We'll just kind of sit and listen to each other and and see which one of us uh, uh, jumps on it first. And I, I will tell you, a few years ago, I did a seminar up in Tennessee, and uh, um, some of the class participants made me a, a, a shirt that said, help, I'm talking, and I can't shut up. <laughs> so I, I'll do my best to kind of shut up and, and listen to these experts up here as much as possible. But we'll try to make sure that we vet these things out as much as we can for you in a session like this. <laughs> Obi Brown uh, is an investigative reporter here at the Telegraph and is a guy that has a wealth of knowledge and experience covering local government. And if anybody sort of feels your pain, uh, he does because he's, he's one of the guys that's been on the front lines doing this stuff all the time. And uh, of course you know Holly and, and the information that she brings to the table, Dr. Miller, and I think brings a real unique perspective to this because she is an advisor at Valdosta State University and not only deals with these things advocating for openness in uh, the government of the, of the school but she works with students and uh, I've never said this to her but I will tell you that uh, when I talk to journalism students and, and folks that I've hired at DSU they always tell me that for their four years there they get more out of your classes and listening to the things that you've said to them than anybody else. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, in addition to that, she uh, double dips by uh, extorting students to say nice things about her. But uh, she, you know, we're really glad to be able to bring her to the table and be able to offer some different perspective, not only from a student's point of view, but as an academic who understands these things in a very philosophical kind of way that I think adds a lot to the dialogue that we're talking about here. So hopefully between the four of us, we can give you real world experience, legal knowledge, a very academic approach to this, and help you as much as possible. I guarantee you, you will not walk away from here and have all of the magic words and, and all of the answers to all of the problems. But hopefully we will all walk away from here helping to build a culture in all of our communities for greater peace. With that, uh, I'm going to open this up to the floor, and you can do this by asking a question, by sharing an experience, and, and see if we have anything relative to that. And it looks like, uh, um, with, a, with some degree of shyness, <laughs> we've got our first one. So, uh, as y'all uh, do this, if you will, tell us sort of what your role is. You're, you're, you're a community watchdog, you're a journalist, you're you know, a mom and dad, you know, and, and what your interest is. Don't go on too much, obviously, and, and, and then let's talk about what your issues are. Go ahead. My name's Gretchen Quarterman. I'm from Lowndes County in the Valdosta area. Um, I started watching government um, when there was a rezoning case in my neighborhood, and I realized that nobody was watching government. Nobody was regularly coming and observing the whole meeting. They were but before I moved to Valdosta, by the Before way. you did, yes, <laughs> long before. Um, and no one would come to the meeting and stay for the whole meeting. There were no citizens that came from the beginning to the end to watch the whole meeting. So I started doing that. Then I started videoing them with a little pocket camera. 
um, from my seat and then they made a rule that said I had to stand in the back corner so now I have to stand in the back corner with my camera and stand for the whole meeting so that I don't disrupt. Um, I have a two-part question. If I understood correctly you said that if the county government has a record available on the day that I ask for it and it's there, maybe I even could lean over the desk and see it, uh, they have to give it to me on that day or they can delay three days and give it to me three days later. The former is a correct interpretation. If it's available, it is not permissible for the public agency to wait out for three days. And that is put in the law effective April 17, 2012, with this idea of rolling production. Okay, well, um, in our county, we, have a, we are trying to get them to publish the packet of materials that they give to the commissioner at the head of the meeting. We know that that's available to them on a Friday for a meeting that happens on Monday and Tuesday. We asked for that on Friday, knowing that it was available on Friday, and we got it on Wednesday. So we asked for it on Thursday, and we got it on Tuesday. We asked for it on Wednesday, and we got it on Monday. And when this time we asked, when do we have to get it? Ask for it to get it on Friday, and then said, you must ask for it on Tuesday when to get it on Friday. However, on Tuesday, it's not necessarily ready and available. So then we're asking a record, which they could immediately answer us there is no such record. We don't have such a thing. Exactly. So I can ask for it on Friday, and they should give it to me. Awesome. <laughs> do, you, do you have the code section on the Good luck. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm making it up to me. Why is now as good a time? Uh, I guess I, I'm so used to House Bill 397. If you'll go on to the next question. Okay, my next question is, well, well, uh, if they uh, have uh, a, I have a two part question. If they have a, if the record is available electronically, minutes for the planning commission, so we have 22 boards and authorities in our county which have appointees which are government meetings, one of which is our planning commission, and I go and video that meeting. Um, I have been having trouble getting the agenda for that meeting and the minutes for that meeting. The minutes are only ever given to me on paper, even though I know that they're not typed on a typewriter. I've been to citizens wishing to be heard with the paper in my hand saying, my Open Records request asked for an electronic copy of the minutes, and I got paper back. I know these are not typed on typewriter. Please could I have an electronic copy? And the answer I get is, leadership told us to give it to you that way. Is that, is that a question for me too? Yeah, no, that's a, that's, yeah. do they, um, if it's electronic, do they have to give it to me that way? If yes, I ask for it? The, yes, the old law and the new law says elect records shall be made available uh, electronically were practicable, but from what you just described, they're not made prepared electronically. They, they are typed on a computer. I mean, you can tell they're not typed on a typewriter, oh, but I they understand. give them to me only on paper. I can't get them they're a word document. I, the law really encourages them, but I, that's a loser, Phil, in terms of you're not going to win that one. So they don't have to give it to me, even though they type, even though it's available in a word document. Um, Thank you. Here, and here's one of the things that you're going to find out, is that if, for instance, any of these things were ever adjudicated, what the courts are going to look at is what was the damage here? Did you get the record? Was the record made available to you? Now, from a theoretic point of view, I understand exactly what you're saying. But, but what the courts would say, and what the AG's office would, what the AG's office would say is, did you get the record? So, you have to wonder, is that the right battle to fight in this case? What you want is the record. What you want are the methods in this case. And I would tell my students to do was to calculate what it costs to make this <coughs> electronics paper, and I would start reporting on the wasted money. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I tell them to do. And, well, and I'll tell you for those money, of you, because I had to pay ten cents a page. No, that's not the point. Okay, because are they giving anyone else the, that paper copy? As soon as they made that copy, it still costs that government time and money to produce it, even if you're paying for it. And if they're giving anybody else those papers, because what they're doing, obviously, is trying to keep you from having electronic copies to make them searchable. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that, that's what you start, that's what you start back with as the answer to that question. And you start asking, what I tell my reporter, I ask them, why are you doing this? And if they say, leadership said, which leadership? I mean, follow it out. And if you ask the question directly, as a closed-ended question, are you doing this to prevent people from being able to search your documents? 
And that's our question. Thank you. Um, the code section you all are looking for is 50-18-71 little b. Little b? B is in boy. On page, on page 14 in this little red book, uh, F, it says here, requester may request that electronic records data under data fields be produced in the format in which such data electronic records are kept by the agency. So if they're keeping them electronically, and just as she was saying, that that's kind of been my thing too, I mean, they're scanned in, what's the deal with just poof? I mean, you push the button to email, you know, rather than going over making a copy, da, da, and you know, faxing it or whatever. But this says here that if it's kept in that format, you're supposed to be able to get it in that format. I don't disagree, but I would say that something in Word, um, that's uh, my laptop's over there and in Word. Um, uh, but it's a, I mean, I'm not going to argue with you. I agree with you, but it's an eight and a half by eleven document in Word, and I've got it on my office, and I'll hand it to you. I'll copy it to you. I don't. I think it's um, bootstrapping up by saying you should email it to me. I, it, the argument's not going to work, even though I happen to agree with you. Yeah, I and I would still, try it. Yeah, I would still ask too. I just it may be just a matter of a conversation, it's kind of like Jim was saying earlier, just a conversation with somebody else to say, you come on. I mean, really. What are y'all doing here? What's going on here? It might just be. Well, I mean, we, we usually get it when we ask for it. Like yeah. that because it's easier for everybody. Right. Right. It's easier for everybody. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> I have a question, and I'm reading from the copy of uh, the. Three ninety seven, and it talks about minutes being available no later than the next regular meeting. Is there anything to be done to ensure, because I know my particular county, you'll get them maybe six weeks after or more, uh, which not so much the judge will say, well, you got it. But it definitely conflicts with what the law says in the, uh, the act. Is there any way that the public can encourage or force, and I really think that Jim's sugar-coated way of dealing with things sometimes needs the massaging of an old two-by-four between the four. <laughs> so that you will get them to do what they're supposed to do. And I'm wondering, knowing, is this wishful thinking on my part that it can be done that way? Or, and try to go to the, the courts, magistrate, or uh, Superior in the county to get an order for, to require them to comply with the rules? Well, first of all, I don't know that anybody's ever accused me of being sugar coated, but secondly, so you're the first. <laughs> um, secondly, are you saying that they do not make the record available to the requester for six weeks, or they say it's not completed for six well, weeks? They, they don't even take them up to approve them. Action by the commissioners to approve the minutes so they can be released. And the law says it has to be by the next regular uh, meeting. So, so they meet monthly or twice monthly? Uh, well, they have a regular meeting monthly. Then they have in between all kinds of. So at the next month's meeting, they don't uh, They don't they have it from the, the previ previous, from, months the previous from the previous time or month and a half or maybe even two months. Right. I mean, I, I mean, Holly can talk about this. I would say they're not in compliance if they're doing that, but um, that, I guess what I'm asking is, is that the monthly routine? Is that, that is that what's happening month after month after month? Well, I'll let the county commissioner speak. I'm the county manager. Hey, okay. my advocates are here from my county, so um, I'm sure they can talk about that. Um, we very much endeavor to have the minutes done by the next meeting. Sometimes we have meetings once a month, sometimes every two weeks. Where we get behind is at budget season where we're having three work sessions a week and three, you know, three meetings a week or a public meeting every week and it's a volume of things. And we're a small rural county of 14,000 citizens so we're one of the smaller counties probably okay. in the room. Um, County? Jasper County. Jasper. Okay. 
Um, so at budget season, yeah, we get behind trying to get the minutes cranked out along with the budget work and everything else going on at budget season. But for the most part, the meetings are, you know, transcribed. The minutes are on the next month's agenda for the board adoption. And within like the next day, two days, the action agenda is up with all of the votes on all of the items that were taken action on. That's, that's up immediately so that people can see that, you know, how the votes went on various subjects. That was true. But we have a small staff. So, you know, we don't, we're not deliberately trying to drag our feet. We're just trying to manage the workload. As the action agenda, you know, there's something I have a great war story about the summary of the um, items made available within what day or two afterwards. Mm -hmm. That sounds like that. Um, mm -hmm. Here's what I've advised other jurisdictions around the state to do, and I don't know what your position is. I know, of course, you may not have one. At doing an open records request for draft minutes. In other words, the drafts of something that is in progress. That, there's no exception for drafts. Therefore, yeah. Um, yeah. if you'd release those, it would only be the final thing that yeah. wouldn't be releasable. Yeah. And that's probably what I would advise a citizen. Right. Do you she's she's, 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 do you she's our, our, our county clerk, so she's doing the minutes during the meeting on a laptop. Of course, it's in draft form until it's adopted by the board. Sure. And we can absolutely release. I, I don't even know that we rarely get a records request for the minutes. Do you, do you anyway, take record your meetings? Do you I'm take sorry? record your meetings? Um, he videos all of our meetings, and we tape record our meetings. And so we've even released tape recordings, you know, for, um, you know, on request of the meetings. and. Um, and we can certainly release draft meetings if someone asks for them. It I can't recall like, somebody asking yeah, for them. Yeah, well, it was funny. I got a call, I think God, it was a decade ago, from Social Circle, and it happened to be for one of my board members, so I was real nervous that I got this <laughs> right. And it was just interesting. I had this really nice dialogue with the custodian or the clerk, and we came up with this. I said, why don't you just release it and just break they're like, it's not going to be right. I said, how about stamp draft? Yeah. They're like, great idea. Oh, yeah. I said, okay. Yeah. And so that, way, that way nobody gets in trouble. Right, and nobody gets confused. Gotta be correct. Exactly. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. to further explain what Holly was talking about, Georgia does not protect works in progress. Now, there are some states that protect works in progress where it becomes very difficult, for instance, to get the budget draft that they're working on during budget season. And, and I had that happen to me a few problems. years ago because I that's what I thought too. Right. And if it was a draft, you weren't supposed to release it. Right. And so that was a learning experience for me because right. in that's some true. places you, you don't release work product like that. Right. And some you do. And so I had held back releasing something that was still a draft. And congratulations and, to you for getting it right. And you know, was advised, and we released it within the three days, so right. we were we were fine. But you know, you, you learn as you go, especially if you move around, the rules change. So. I have to say that a lot of what we deal with is just simply inertia. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the way we've always done it. It's the way we do it. It's way it's, it's just yeah yeah. Or maybe that's, it was the way it was done not, twenty uh, years ago. Yeah, that's and, just not know, uh, you know. it's just not acceptable. Yeah. They, you know, so. Question about agendas. Uh, when you have an agenda and the way the agenda is written it has the header, you know, where it's going to be, and the time at the top, 6 p.m., and then you come down here and there's a little print work session 515. It's, uh, is this okay for an agenda to be like this? When you're looking at the agenda and you see it says 6 o'clock, you're thinking 6 o'clock, and then Two days later, all of a sudden, you realize, oh, there's a work session at 5:15. Shouldn't the work session either have a separate agenda, or shouldn't the time of their say 5:15 if that's when they're really going to meet? Okay, free shaking. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I think so. <laughs> yes, I've always taken a very hardline position that uh, work sessions, working, whatever they're called, um, are subject to subject to the Open Meetings Act, just like any other regular meeting. And I also would suggest an agenda for that. I mean, in terms of type, font size, and all those things, the statute's not that specific. But uh, clearly, in that case, if it was a separate meeting, I would argue for a separate agenda. Let me ask this. Uh, even if the time up here would be different to show when it actually started, you know, because it's before the other meeting. But 
Yeah. It's, it's, it's our clock, no and then it's down here. Well, in the and if there is no time, or the time's not obscure, then it's not been properly public notice. But let me ask you all this question. How many of you have jurisdictions where votes are actually taken in work session? I've seen it before. Okay, it is not uncommon at all uh, throughout <coughs> Georgia for basically a city council or a county commission to actually have a separate business meeting that they call a work session and they're taking votes and, and ratifying action during those work sessions. And the thing is, it's not illegal so long as they've done two things. Uh, number one, it's been public notice, and number two, there's a quorum present. And Georgia defines a meeting, and, and I think um, very broad ways, but I'll tell you, if, if we can collectively advocate for changes and improvements to Georgia's open meetings laws, there are two things that we need to address. One is how broad the privilege is for executive session. And number two, just strike the word quorum from the language. In Georgia, any number of any commission or council or board can meet and vote get all they want to so long as it's not a quorum. In many states, the law says that no two or more elected officials can deliberate the public's business in private. That ought to exist in Georgia and in every state in the nation. What happens in Georgia is that these two get together, these three get together, these four get together, and they build a voting block. And it's not illegal. We need to send a strong message that while it's not illegal, it is wrong. We had a commissioner tell us in the town hall meeting that they could talk by phone all they wanted to, and they just decided everything by phone ahead of time, and then they go and vote. It's obvious at the meeting. Vote Mary, getting Mary, happens he every did not say that. He did not say that. That's not the way he just put it's on it. Video. Well, I will tell you, though, vote getting happens everywhere. And the, the intent of all public officials ought to be and the message that we ought to resonate is that all of the public's business should be done before the public. As citizens, we not only have a right to know what government does, we have a right to know why they're doing it. The deliberative process is what we're talking about, and those deliberations should be in front of you, not on the telephone, on an email, or behind closed doors. But so long as the language says that a meeting is made up of a quorum, legally, they can talk on the phone and, and, and get together in groups or two or three or anything less than a quorum all they want to. Now, do they have to? No. And so we can send a message that's not in the public's best interest. I promise to be brief. Um, hi, you said to introduce yourself. I have was at Macon State College now, Middle Georgia State College for 15 years in the office of the president. Um, and for three years, I, in my last 15 years, I was taken to private meetings and told to falsify documents and to keep, it goes on and on, I could write a book and I probably will. My point <laughs> is, <laughs> oh I am, but um, this is for your meeting on October 31st. I would, and I'll be happy to send it to you and just some bullets to ask Sam Owens. One, um, he, in fact, it's my understanding that he even has a statement on your website. I saw it a couple of years ago. Uh, Sam Owens had some kind of open transparency or open government. Was that? The, I was think you're thinking of Vernon Keenan, the GBA director. Okay, maybe. But anyway, I did see. Well, Owens does have that statement on his um, well, secretary. I mean, the um, the Department of Law yes. website, where right. the, the, you know open about government. open government. He is self proclaims open transparency, open government. Uh, but in fact, in reality, on legal record, he does just the opposite. My uh, whistleblower case is a prime example, and nobody will touch it except CBS Atlanta came to my home in Macon. Of course, Macon, the newspaper won't touch it. But uh, they even brought their film crew to my home. And what we've asked Sam, what I'd like you to ask Sam Owens, is if he is mandating government transparency, why is he sealing the documents in my case? 
I have filed four motions, and believe me, the money I've spent with attorneys, I could, I lost my house, by the way, and filed bankruptcy after I lost my job. Because I stood up and said, I will not falsify these documents anymore, nine days later, after 15 years of exceeds evaluations, expectations, I was fired. Um, but I want you to ask Sam Owens, if you mandate open government, why are you, every time she files a motion to lift the protective order, these depositions confirm everything in my whistleblower case, and he has filed, Sam Owens has filed, four motions opposing it. Now, but this is a red flag to somebody, that there's something to hide? I, I will tell you, uh, first of all, send me your talking points. I will. And um, open government's kind of like the weather. Everybody talks about it, but nobody ever does anything right. about it. And I have met very, very, very few people running for office that do not pledge transparency. But the rhetoric does not match the practice. And I'm not saying that about Sam Owens or Stefan Ritter. I'm saying that it's true. about a culture that exists that we are responsible for changing. May I say one more thing? Executive session, this is another thing that you can point out to him. When you mentioned executive session, I it just the the stars just went up because in my case, and and the, you gotta realize this is not a Denise personnel case. This affects every faculty, staff, and student that's ever submitted an appeal to board regents, and from 30 public colleges, I have a list a mile long, just pages and pages. People that have contacted me saying, please keep me updated. They wait even when talking about a class action lawsuit. They are criminally, as you know, that in the deposition in my whistleblower case we found out that they don't even read the appeals. And Sam Owens wants that kept um, sealed. I intervened and use it, used it as an exhibit, and now it's open record. In other words, I went around it. And um, so that deposition is available to you, and it says repeatedly, no, we don't even look at them. She did not even know, by the way, that she was the vice chair. I had to tell her my attorney had to <laughs> Well, let me tell you all that <coughs> government and we use that word in such a broad context, mm -hmm. but whether it, it, it's an AG, a DA, a board chairman, uh, a commission member, does not have to agree with us about anything. But the law is the law, and, and they need to comply with the law. I do. You, you do know we're going after Rico racketeering against AG now. And, and, and I will tell you all that what's good for the goose is good for the gander, too. And you can't just sit and, and talk about openness and require openness in others and, and not be open and transparent yourself. And again, that's not just the AG's office. But, you know, I've had county commissioners go along with things going on executive session for weeks, months, years, be a part of it, and then get mad. <coughs> and all of a sudden, they want to tell us everything that everybody else is doing, though they've been doing it themselves for a long time. That's why, again, I know I'm beating the same drum, that we need to create an expectation of openness. And the presumption should always be that every record is there. The AG's office is not going to be our absolute remedy. So is what, what, what are our choices then? To our stay lawyer. In, other words, in other words, go ahead and lose our second house that we've already lost our first. <laughs> just, just keep going. And th that's what he's yeah. hoping. Well, and, and it may very well be that um, there are... I would are just like his answer as to why he mandates right. open transparency but seals these documents. That's what I'm asking. Well, it may... I will tell you my frustration with that, Jesus, office, okay? <laughs> the coming case everybody's looking at as being a landmark decision. Mm -hmm. The coming case is a baby step. Right. It's a good baby step, but it's a baby step. <clears throat> Are you telling me that until somebody wanted to videotape a meeting and coming, that in two years nobody violated Georgia's Open Meetings Act? Thank you. But do y'all know how many times the fine's been imposed? Zero. Until coming, 
Well, who doesn't no. know you can't film in a meeting? So, I mean, well, that's just apparently somebody does. <laughs> I mean, everybody has folks filming in meetings. Right. That's very common. Well, we well, had the police drag them out of meetings and going out. But, yeah. but, well, again, yeah. but again, the, the point that I'm making is, is that that's just one small thing, and it's become a poster child. Mm -hmm. There must be, there, there have got to be more cases out there. Y'all keep pushing. I'm not telling you not, not to push push stuff to the AG's office. I'm telling you to push more stuff to the AG's office. Are you familiar with the Rule 60 motion? Are you yeah. familiar with Rule 60 motion? It's, it's filed in Fulton County. It basically is going to throw out Sam Owens' summary judgment, and it's going to allow me back in because of the new Georgia Supreme Court ruling on whistleblowers. That is our next step. If that happens, he'll start talking. I'm Sabrina Smith. I'm with Georgia Watchdogs, and we work with uh, Georgia Watchdog groups all across the state. I've been traveling around the state, working with these groups, talking to these people, and um, I think the I certainly understand the frustration that Denise has because hers is not the only RICO lawsuit against Sam Olins. And you were talking about um, being nice and asking uh, uh, in a polite way, and that's what I tell everybody too, and I think that's a very important point. I also agree with you when you're saying we are really the issue. We need to hold them accountable. We cannot count on Sam Owens to do it, and quite honestly, and I don't mind saying this very bluntly because I can prove it. Everything that I say, I prove with documentation. I'm an accountant, not a lawyer, but I document everything. And um, Sam Olins is not enforcing the law. I filed an open records request on the AG's office to find out how many open records complaints they receive. And uh, of course, they put me off, put me off, put me off. That's an interesting request. By yeah. <laughs> and Stephen, and when I kept pushing Stephen, he said, "Well, I didn't realize that was an open records request." I said, "Stephen, let me put it in a different form for you and send it back to him." So do you know, and this actually surprised me, even though I get complaints from people every day saying they're not giving me this, what do I do about that? But um, Stephen said they average six complaints per day. And do you know how much, and you do know, um, that they have taken zero enforcement action on any open records violation since Olins has been in office, zero. And Nydia Tisdale, I love her to death. I am so glad somebody's standing up for her because what they did to her was wrong. But she is, it, you know, having someone pulled out of a meeting is nothing compared to what's going on. If you look at what Gary is dealing with with the Cobb Brake Stadium and what occurred there, Roy, what they did with the Paulding Airport, you look at my lawsuit um, in Gwinnett County, you talk about being nice. Actually, I've gotten along great with all of these people that I've sued in Gwinnett. I was having lunch with Shirley Lasseter at Magnolia Cafe before the FBI got her. We had a very nice lunch. <laughs> She's in the fed pen now. Um, I've been in Kevin Kennerly's house, beautiful home that he built with his million dollar brides that he only had to pay a $10,000 fine for. Um, Charlotte Nash and I get along just great. We were joking about my broken leg the other day. I sat around Tommy Hunter's dining room table fighting with somebody over an open record they wouldn't get <laughs> You handed me that one. But um, the Attorney General was the one who encouraged me to file my open records lawsuit in Gwinnett because they said, and I believed them, I was so naive at the time, they said that we're getting so many violations of open records all across the state, your lawsuit will be precedent setting, and we think we can use that as a hammer against all of these violations across the state. So Sabrina stupidly spends a couple of years, my life, thousands of dollars, and it would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up if you sat down and read what occurred in my lawsuit. And Sam Olins took direct action to undermine my lawsuit, mm -hmm. and I can show you that. And it's not just my lawsuit. Ask Roy, ask Gary, ask all of these watchdogs all across the state what Sam Olins has done. Not just that he didn't provide assistance, because he can say, well, we don't have the budget, and we just that and the other. But that's what he directly did, such as what he did to Denise, such as what he did at Georgia Perimeter College. There's still $9 million missing and unaccounted for at Georgia Perimeter College that has never been investigated by anybody. So we're not talking about, did they give it to me in three days or four days? I'm nice about that. If they run a little late, I don't care. 
but I'm talking about criminal activity that's occurring in the state of Georgia, and you're saying, well, the DAs won't get involved in open records, open meetings, or whatever. DAs are not getting involved in a lot of things, and Attorney General Olins is allowing a lot of this to go on. So my question is, in situations like that, then what is our next step? I'm nice as I can be to these folks. Right. First of all, let me let me say you're not going to get any of us to defend government. Um, well, secondly, the only thing at all, and I disagree with what you said, is somebody did investigate the Georgia Premier situation. It's a young man by the name of David Schick. Right, I know and that. And if y'all don't know about the work that, that, that David did, yes. the, the fact is, that's what it takes, is somebody exposing it. Now, David has not righted the wrong, right. but he has shined the light. And, and it is, and it, it is. Why, why hadn't the Attorney General stepped in then once yeah. you see the wrong? Well, that's I, the question I think you're going to ask. Well, what? again, uh, the, and the, in fact, the AG let, I think, the citizens of Georgia and David down during, yes. during court proceedings. While that, and, and that thing's still not said. But it can't just be those landmark cases in order to, to change the mindset. What I'm telling you is not the quick answer. What I'm telling you is the big picture. And the big picture is that what you're doing may be the right thing, but as many of you as are in this room, when compared to the communities and to the number of citizens in the state of Georgia, it pales. It's only a very few. I don't know your relationships with your local media, but you've got to foster and build those relationships. We try. And I agree with you. And I've, and I've told you already, there are too many newspapers that are not doing any watchdogging whatsoever, nor do they want to. They might lose advertising. I had uh, a telegraph reporter in my home at Ashford Chase Court say to me, to my face, I cannot do this story because the and I won't repeat the name, is worried about losing the advertising. Right. Now, college. I'm going to, for all of you newspaper people in the room, I will tell you something. And I do not, I, I, I'm not saying this in any way to uh, tell you that it has anything to do with the motivations behind open government advocacy. But I will tell you this, for those of you that have the ear of your publisher or the owner of your newspaper chain, open government sales. Yeah. Open government drives readership. <laughs> Transparency advocacy will grow the newspaper quicker than anything that you could do. Jim, you said, I think almost at the start, that we are the problem, that, that the people are allowing this, and so we are the problem. Well, now we're sitting here four weeks ahead of Sam Olin's running for office again. Why are all of your newspaper people not taking notes on this and doing everything he can now to publish, to get the people back in the game and let them see that a slick politician has been there for a while. And maybe it's better than the fool we don't know than the one we do. If I can just make one comment Amen. to follow up with well, that. Are we going to do that? When it did make the news that Sam Mullins was fined $10,000 for withholding evidence in the Stacey Calverman Ethics Commission lawsuit. Um, Friday before last, another attorney in DeKalb Superior Court filed another motion for sanctions against Sam Owens for exactly the same thing in a different lawsuit. I've not seen that reported anywhere. And I think that's news if he's done it again. And of course, I, the same thing has happened with Denise. I haven't seen that. But he's done the exact same thing again. And um, the investigation at Georgia Perimeter College was not the only one that he didn't investigate. There are other issues that he has not investigated across the state of Georgia, too. Right. And I will tell you, it's almost as if, and I'm just going to say this about the Cumming case, and I want to get some more from the other panel members here. It was almost as if the Cumming case was just too easy. You know, it, it gave a chance to beat the drum. You've been talking to people in the AG's office. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody in the you, AG's office is not happy with all of this. Don't you yeah. think? Don't you think it's strange that that case was filed two years ago and it came out right for right election during time? The election season. How and interesting was yeah, that? And I, it's the only case yeah. that he ever filed in four years. Yeah, you're preaching the choir on that. One. Okay, let, let, let me 
let me get the, the rest of our guys up here to sort of in, engage in this conversation. <laughs> Always thinking. <laughs> and sir, if I could, if I could just come in. Uh, on my website, gwmac.com, I'm Georgia Watch Macon, gwmac.com, I did a full expose of Sam Olin, so some people are covering. In fact, just right after the Greg Hecht uh, debate, which was last Sunday on PBS, and you can see the full debate on my website as well. I've docu and I've spoken with, I'm friends with Dave Schick, uh, Anthony Tricoli. I've, begin, I've begun to investigate this Board of Regents. And the one thing that concerned me is, like Denise said, there's a 97% denial of students and employees who appeal to the Board of Regents. Many of the Board of Regents don't even know they're on the Appeals Committee. Did you realize that? All of the, every single one of the Board of Regents are friends of either the current governor or the previous governor. Uh, Pruitt is uh, one of the biggest donors uh, in the nurse, nursing care industry, the Pruitt industry. So he was recently appointed uh, to the Deal Committee after you know, millions of dollars to the super PAC that donates to Deal. And there's another guy, Will, Willamette, Willett, he was, I'm not sure. He was, uh, Will Holt. Will Holt. He was on uh, Deal's 2010 Will campaign Will 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 right, manager. And he was recently appointed to the Board of Regents. I mean, the group there, and I wrote an article about the Board of Regents as well I want to get into. So, sir, some people are trying to cover it. I encourage you to check out my site, gwmac.com. Very recently, and I reported everything on Sam Olin's, but you're absolutely, your instincts are absolutely correct. We might get uh, Dr. Miller kind of involved here, because these are sort of areas that she might have a particular thought or expertise on. No? Well, you're, what, are you, what are you going, are you asking me about, are you asking me about the politics of the Board of Regents? All of the above. No, they, they would like advice, they would like, you know, ideas. Well, that, that, that. My, my question is, how do the citizens of Georgia encourage reform at the Board of Regents? Now, what I've done is I've investigated, well, how do other states do it? How does New York, how does Iowa, how does Wisconsin, how do they, how do they appoint a Board of Regents? A lot of them will say, well, only half the board can be from one political party. So you have to have like 50% Republican, 50% Democrat. They also say that you can't have more, if you have like a big state university like Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin, just like in Georgia, UGA is the big one. Yeah. They say you can't have more than two members of the Board of Regents from that school. You have, to, you have to have people from all over the state. You have to have women. You have to have minorities. If you look at the Board of Regents, there's two women and one uh, African-American man. Everyone else are old, white, very, very, very rich individuals, males, of course. Sounds like South Georgia. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> but how how do we how do we reform the board yeah. of regents uh, when when other guys have been taken? Okay, I'll tell you what, investigative reporters and editors would suggest, or what, unless someone went up to nightclub was suggesting, and that is the use of uh, social mapping to show the relationships between these people and do that all the boards and all the money and to get that publicized. Um, and I think probably the way you get publicized the best now is going to be through social media rather than the straight. And like you've got so much social media now coming out of the um, coming out of uh, the legacy me media that if okay, let me give you, let me give the the best analogy I've ever seen to get someone in power to do something they're like lizards on a rock you have to eat the rock you eat the rock with public opinion. And so uh, when you you, get, here's the problem with the Board of Regents. It's in the state constitution. Yeah. Going back to okay. what 1923, the Georgia State Constitution, on how the Board of Regents is selected. So then, in order to change it, we would have to have a constitutional amendment. That may be, but that's not the point of, you might not have to change the Board of Regents. You need to change the actions of the Board of Regents. Well, okay. unless you change the people, you're not going to change the actions. Unless you make the action that they do less profitable than the action well, that they do. It's very are. profitable. <laughs> We're going at the criminal side. Right? I, mean, I, I want to move this away a little bit from the, from the BOR and talk specifically about it as it relates to openness and, and, and access. And uh, I will tell you though that Dr. Miller referenced uh, investigative reporters and editors. If you're not plugged in to IRE, I believe it's IRE.org. Yeah, IRE.org. They have great toolkits available, uh, especially for doing things like tracking data, uh, doing demographic type. Uh, it, it'll, it'll provide you 
a wealth of information that goes way beyond the census data on the government's website. And some, some great toolkits available to you. And you can join IRE for pennies on the dollar. I mean, it's, it's not very expensive, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't even say it's pennies, but it's, it's relatively cheap. And I, and I actually think they're bringing some workshops to Georgia at some point. Excuse me, but are you saying IRE.org? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Investigative reporters and editors, okay. or get your IRA. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're already there, thanks. Last issue, I think, was on education. So, yeah. and I think it was K through 12. Olive, you got any advice or direction for them? Uh, how to change the composite of the Board of Regents. I have my own battles with the Board of Regents. Uh, so if we want to tell war stories, there was an exception that passed the General Assembly um, that the Board of Regents is the only state body who, for department heads, there's less um, 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 consideration public has access to the finalist for less time. And there I am yelling. They would. Normally at the legislature they'll listen to me because it was the Board of Regents on the other side. They're like, yeah, Holly, okay, that's fine. And you know, I didn't, but um, so it's an incredibly, it's among the more powerful. They're untouchable. They, 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 yeah. they, they are that, that was untouchable. my first kind of direct, I mm -hmm. sort of had, but this was the first, and the, actually, no offense, the media let me down. They said, First Amendment Foundation, yeah. well, you got to say that. So I stood up and I said, why should this board have a more closure? What we need to know, but untouchable uh, among the most. So I have no advice. Um, I welcome any advice you can I give me. I did go to Senator Buddy Carter and ask for a meeting with the Senate Higher Education Committee. I have an email, which I, I would think the newspaper would love it. It says the, AT, the Attorney General's office said not to meet with you. The, the, thing, the thing about all that with the Board of Regents, it's all about who gives the most money to the government. Yeah, exactly. That's all that that's about. Well, let me tell you this. Right now, the VOR is traveling around the state. And they're holding their meetings outside of Atlanta. Show up and show up in mass. Um, they would been there, done that. <laughs> they, they run when they see me coming. And they, yeah. Look, I, I've seen city councils uh, consider things that are much, you would consider much lesser kind of issues. But if you think about it, all issues that people have with their government at the end of the day are open government issues, they're transparency issues. Just about any problem you have with government, if you chisel it down, is a transparency issue. How are they spending your money? It's a transparency issue. What are they doing behind closed doors? It's a transparency issue. What, what are they gonna do with that piece of property? It's a transparency issue. So most issues that people have with their government are in fact, the very kinds of things that have brought you to the table today. Uh, local city council wanted to close down a swimming pool because they were saying it was bleeding the city dry. So they were going to do it very, very quickly in a city council meeting, and the local newspaper got word of it. Not only was the council hall filled, but the parking lot was filled, the porch was filled, People showed up in droves because it was their swimming pool. And the council completely reversed itself and decided to all of a sudden sink money into the swimming pool and make it a better facility. Now, do I think that those government officials had a change of heart? No, I'm not that naive. They all knew they had to run for re-election. They all knew that they the only way they stayed in power were those people that were standing on the porch and standing out in the yard. That is our power. It's the power of the vote. But if there's just a handful of us here or there, they're not worried about the handful. They're worried about the herd. The other, the other problem with that is, Jim, when you have meetings at 515 in the afternoon, <coughs> most people aren't even home from work yet. You can't what? get a whole group of people together. So what happens? They do special call meetings. Not at 515, they'll do them at 10 o'clock in the morning. Right, right. Where are you at? That, that's that's been a big problem with people like that, you know. It, uh, if, if, there's some of us that try to make an effort to be there whenever, if we can. And, and if you have your own business, you can do that sometimes. But people that work or they work out of town, they can't show up for a meeting like that. And government, they, don't think that they don't know what they're doing. Right, they do. Okay, let, let me hear from somebody we haven't heard from. I got one. 
Okay. I'm Rhonda Walsh. I'm from Hale, Jeff Davis County, which is Hazel, right. Georgia. And um, I'm a watchdog. Oh, yeah. I know <laughs> you <Yes>. too. <laughs> but um, my situation started, um, I was on the recreation board. And we noticed money was missing. And I wasn't asking too many questions, and they booted me off the board. That didn't stop me. Um, I went to the uh, first county commissioner's meeting had public comments, I get up, I tell it all. We have about a two hour meeting just for me. So that was on like July the 12th. A week later, they called an executive session meeting to interview me and everyone else that was involved, called us in their one-on-one, -on -one, which was an illegal meeting, to discuss that. Two days later, they had an emergency meeting at one o'clock in the day to go and have a restraining order filed against me to keep me out of any public building. <laughs> About five days later, they, um, uh, And George, you probably could have gone in if you were packing. <laughs> <laughs> um, they uh, appointed our county attorney, the uh, records custodian, because they didn't like me going into the different offices requesting for information that I was readily getting. You know, they were turning it over to me. They wanted to see what I was getting. So now me and the records custodian, she's a thorn in my side and I'm a thorn in her side. I have filed numerous complaints with the AG's office. Me and Stefan Ritter, we're pretty good buds, but he just don't like to return our emails. He's made two trips to Jeff Davis County. He still has done nothing. His thing is, and I, I want to know y'all's viewpoint on how many open re records requests is too many, because they say I've done too many. And I don't give them a lot of the amount of time to fill those requests. And if I give her five and you don't give them in three days, I'm not going to bring it over here. So be it. But when it's two months late, three months late, you know, and everything that I've accused them of has just happened to come out because I got in contact with the Board of account uh, Audits and we got the finding, my findings um, published in the um, annual audit. Mm -hmm. Now our county auditor has been fired. Mm -hmm. He has a five-year contract. That contract's no longer any good because it's not in the minutes. Oh, really? That ain't the way y'all been doing uh, meetings. Okay. It's all voted outside the meetings and it's not recorded on the minutes. But it's a, it's a big mess. But um, with all that, I have decided to run for county commissioner. <laughs> so, we're trying to do some things. So, uh, talking about the newspaper, he has told me to sit down and shut up. Okay? And his paper. Um, I'm throwing in his side, too. Um, he does not, all he, and I brought, I brought his paper, too, somewhere here. Um, he posted it, it was like for elected officials today. But, um, and his paper is the reason I am here today. But um, he likes to publish, you know, the, the school stuff, the kids, the sports. And from what I'm being told, they don't like bad publicity on the front page of the newspaper because Atlanta's watching your newspaper. And if you're doing bad things, they won't give you these grants and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, I started a Facebook page. Social media is the best way because nobody in Jeff Davis County likes my Facebook page because I click them public documents. I have spent over $1,500 out of our money for public documents in two years, and it's still counting. But um, they would not, um, I thought, you know, I'm running for election, you know, I need to know all these little different things that's happening around town. Let me become a member of the Chamber of Commerce to put my business, <laughs> not me, but my business. <laughs> they denied my membership, right. sent my money back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not very good at this. I'll let y'all know how the election turns out, okay? <laughs> First of all, the reason you got a round of applause is it's because we can sit and complain all we want to and be a part of the complaining and the naysaying, or we can decide to do something about it. What better way to clean up the scoundrels than to become one of them? <laughs> <laughs> you can't beat them, join them. Let me respond to one legal issue you raised, which is probably pretty relevant for everybody in this room. 
The question legally is how many open records requests is too many. And there have been states around the country who were to try to cap them. Yeah. There is no such thing as too many. And that's a point that I personally and professionally took a stand on in any number. Um, it, it, it's not going to work in Georgia or the U.S., but I don't want to <laughs> grandstand. You talk about nuisance. You, talk, it, it, you can't do it from a First Amendment perspective. You put a cap on how many open records requests somebody files. It, it, it's a downward slide. So right now in Georgia, there's no cap. And as long as I'm around doing this work, there's not going to be one. I do have a couple questions. Um, the, um, I've asked for, we've had a little instance with our sheriff's department's kind of had a few bad deals going on here recently. And there was one instance that a deputy tased a guy, you know, trying to get him in handcuffs, get him to the, to the jail. And once he got to jail, he supposed to got a broke neck and all this kind of stuff. So I requested a copy of the video cam in the, in the patrol car. Um, I also requested a copy of the video at the jailhouse because there's video surveillance. And uh, I've been told I can't get either of it. Number one is open investigation. Number two, um, the video at the jail is going to show other inmates that's not involved. So what's the... Um, um, nine more, uh, the video that the officer takes it is subject to release under the open record. There's a dispute in the law, and the Blue Book touches on it, about whether 911 calls and those initial, the taping by the officers is analogous to an incident, initial incident report, which is always readily available regardless <coughs> of the status of the investigation, or it's considered differently. I would take the position, if I were you, and I know it's hard to do, but that it's subject to release regardless of the status of the investigation. As for the jail staff, wouldn't their uh, answer be for them to redact the parts dealing with the other inmates? Well, they and I, they told me they would try to get a call stone. Well, that's been a month and a half ago. I've gotten no, no final response on that, <coughs> what the cost would be to do that to that video. And I think one of the things that Holly alluded to earlier is that when you do get a production letter, basically saying, you know, we are going to comply, the record does exist, that can't be for perpetuity. Now, the law doesn't, unfortunately, give us all the tools and mechanisms we need. It doesn't define the period. But the courts will say that you can't just put them off forever. Um, and for, and I think this may be something that, that Obi can address, but I think it does all this does raise the discussion about cops and it is not uncommon at all for law enforcement to try to protect everything under this broad investigatory uh, moniker and no arrest report no initial incident report <coughs> can be a part of an investigative file and be protected all of those initial reports that are generated our public records. You, I'm sure y'all find that so. I have heard that. The yeah, initial report is. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you will get narrative in there that is certain. Okay, too. It's in there. Yeah, we we see you here. Bibb County have a pretty good process, pretty good system. I know I've, I've worked in places where it's <coughs> terrible. Yeah, you have to fight for, for that. So, yeah, I don't know. Well, I'll talk to you before you leave, too. That has worked. I live out in Florida, Georgia, basically. It's where I live. I'm so far in the country, it's still 1958. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little town down from me that was a speed trap. And people got real tired of it, and one of the citizens of the town put up a billboard in his yard. Put up, this is a speed trap. This is the officer. This is who you should be walking for. It's protected by the First Amendment. I'd start putting up, here are my open records requests. This is the number of days your government has not complied. Oh, I'd do that on Facebook. I wouldn't do it on Facebook. I'd do it in public. So if I were gonna okay, this is gonna get me fired. So you know, call me Dr. Mill, you better call me back, it's gonna get me fired. Um, if I were gonna deal with the Board of Regents problem, this is the stat you need to know. Mm -hmm. Students are now being required to pay more tuition, greater percent of tuition than ever before. 
or the people who are going to get hot under the collar about that or parents, parents. who are chucking out those bucks. And yeah. so what I would do is I would start that as my issue, and that will change the well, bill or page. Can I say something? Yes. In 2009, I drove to McDonald's, Georgia, and met with Jim Walls of Atlanta and Filtered and said, look here and look here and look here. He wrote a tremendously wonderful article about all the money on the table. It was $7. million on the table to seven presidents. I have done exactly what you're saying, and I've gotten nowhere. If the what I'm asking you, what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I have if, said the tuition's going up, but their pockets are filling up. Okay, but the point is, mm -hmm. all right, if I'm, how many students are in the university system in Georgia? Okay, and they're getting paid by this. So when you point out to the parents that that ratio of state appropriation to tuition is going up, you get them hot about that issue, it will change the behavior of all the regions. I guess what I'm saying is you, I have, I will certainly try again, but I have done that, and it's, I've gotten, in fact, in the uh, uh, flyer I'll give you, there's uh, two pages of um, fiscal misappropriations of millions of dollars that I have kept up with and have put out there as much as I can. The point is, the parents don't care about that. Right. I thought you said that. Right. No. I, I, they I, care I, about I, their I, own pocket. Yeah, I know about that. I see what you're saying. One of, them is the one of them is the AJC report that says tuition has gone up again and that the uh, administrators are, are get, still getting millions of dollars on the table. Well, I what, I, what, what I would say is I, I see your point and I agree with your point. And you could write <coughs> the most, you know, Pulitzer Prize worthy <coughs> article, you know, just absolute perfection. But how did the people in the state of Georgia actually read it? You know, I mean, I get around 10,000 visitors to my site a week, which is pretty good for a blog. And I just started in July, so I think right. it's actually fantastic. You know, hopefully I'll get 100,000 by next year. But you know, only 6,000 people are, are reading my articles about, about the Board of Regents. And I've written a story about the tuition, by the way. I've already written that story. How do I get people to read that? Yeah. That's the next step. That's the missing step. Of this the is what you're going to have to do with teaming up with people doing social media so that it bubbles up to the public consciousness. And how you do that is, <laughs> don't take this as glib, put a cat video on now. But <laughs> how you do that is you've got to get somebody set on fire. So if you're going to do the research on what makes, for example, social media go viral, the same way when Robin Cook wrote, Cook wrote Coma all those years ago, he did an analysis of what made bestsellers for novels. That's exactly what he did. He took every single piece and put it together in a single book, and that's why Coma was a bestseller. Figure out. There's <laughs> research now. There's a lot of research now out on what makes things tend to go viral. Mm -hmm. And if you've got something that seems really mundane, because finance people don't like to read about finances. But if you're pointing out to them, okay, if you've got a college age kid, you're going to have a college age kid, okay, this is what you can expect to be paying out of your pocket. This is what this Board of Regents is making. This is what these presidents are making. And you personalize it, you make it something, it gets picked up here, it gets picked up here, it gets picked up here. And then all these little pockets that we've been talking about, you know, you give them a reason to coalesce. It's going to get somebody's attention. And it may be the AJC's attention. Yeah, but that's been a logical way. Uh, well, I'm working with Jeff Seltzer of the uh, Journal of Law who is on Board of Regents and, and exactly what you're saying. For example, Huckabee, the, the chancellor, he makes over 500000 a year. Okay. A lot of people don't know that. that our school nice. superintendent, our county school superintendent, makes more than Huckabee. Oh, God. Well, this is the place to build yourself a fusion table for Board of Regents and uh, all the school officials across the United States comparatively with cost of living factors and put a fusion table up there and I guarantee you that kind of stuff gets hit. Right. Guys, a lot of this goes beyond um, open government, government transparency. <laughs> but let me just ask you a quick question again. How many of you are with watchdog groups? And how many of you have websites and blogs? And how many of those websites and blogs are linked to one another? Is that what I'm saying? Yeah. What I'm saying is is you're not you think you're doing the networking, We're but not. you're really not. Kristen Finney's in the back of the room, and she's a, a digital editor. And I'm sure Kristen will probably tell you that it's not just enough to throw something on a site or throw something on a blog. You've got to build all of those connections. How many of you have groundbreaking video on your sites? Roy does. Well, and the, and the thing about it is, and a, a guy like me hates to admit this, but if you want attention, you got to have video. You know, how many times do you ever hear people say viral words? You ever heard that? Never. Right? The only kind of viral word that I know of is Ebola. So the only way that you get viral is by doing what? By video. 
The only thing you ever heard is gone viral was viral videos. But we're not, you're not doing those kinds of things. So again, a lot of this goes sort of outside of the parameters of open government. But I guess part of the message that I'm trying to tell you is you think that you have raised awareness and that you're, again, beating the drum. But you're only beating a small drum in a small area. Absolutely. It's going to take the networking, the collectivity, the collaboration, the amalgamation of everything that you're talking about. Okay, we have some other, yeah, back here. Uh, my name's Ron Davis. I'm from Baldwin County. All right. And um, regarding the open.georgia.gov website, do you know if there are any counties who have embraced the effort to create something similar like to that site, but on a county level? Let me tell you something unbelievable. Um, everybody knows who Victor Hill is, right? Yeah. Yeah, everybody knows about how corrupt Clayton County is, right? Clayton County, Georgia has one of the most transparent websites in the state of Georgia. They, uh, Sunshine.org and, and, that, and that group has given Clayton County kudos for the transparency of its website. There are some people that are doing things to make government more transparent. However, they also have three-hour standing executive sessions almost every month. Uh, <coughs> So I'm not here to tell you that, that Clayton County is getting it all right. But there are some good models going on out there. And, and again, please don't think. I, I'm not in any way in the hip pocket of government telling you that government's getting it right. But when government does make agendas and meeting minutes available on their website, it, give them credit for it. Pat them on the back for doing that. That's what you want them to do. We're not trying to prove how bad they are. We want them to be better, don't we? So when they do get it, I put it on your blog. If you're if you're a county commissioner or, or the people you're blogging about, all of a sudden decides that they're going to talk about personnel or, or land acquisition in open public meeting, give them kudos for doing that. Let's hold them accountable. Let's hold their feet to the fire. Let's call them scum when they are. But, but when they're not, when they get it right, let's give them a thumbs up. When it happens, let us know. <laughs> like I said, Clayton County developed one of the most transparent government websites in Georgia. And, and when I was up there, we gave them credit for it. And the next time, we, we slapped them in the face for saying that they were required to go into executive session. I'll get back to the law enforcement issues. Um, I'm Metro Editor at the Times in Gainesville. Hi. Um, Thanks for coming up. Yeah, it's been good. Um, a lot of our issues are with law enforcement. Um, Certainly have ours with the commission and the city council. But going back to incident reports, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but we have an issue with our Gainesville Police Department. Yes, we want the incident report. Well, it's not done yet. We want the victim's names. But you can't have, they you know, they cannot be notified two days later, three days later. Four days later, oh, we have some names. We had an incident where we were two feet in front of the suspect that was being arrested, and we, we had we a had picture a, on the picture. front page. This big. I, yeah, right. I could read to you we the text he was on his chest. Okay, let, let me ask you this, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not picking on the newspaper. I, I do what you do. Has the newspaper done a front page story saying Gainesville PD denies incident report? Breaking the law. Fails yeah. to release names. It, it was in the or, article about the incident. But put it in a headline. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, if you can't get them to do the right thing because it's the law, embarrass the heck out of them. Yeah, but I mean, is it the law? I mean, when, when do they have to finish that incident report? Probably can address this, but the, what, what the law says, what I would suggest to you is that the incident report is a record, and the record has to be made available when they have it. I mean, there's, your, um, the one rule of thumb in law enforcement is that you can't are immediately available or available regardless of the status of the investigation. The question you raise, I don't think there is any time a oh, police yeah. department has to, I mean, I don't know, it's certainly not an open records issue. I mean, it's a great way to get around the open records act, though, isn't it? If you just delay creating the record. So, and I guess that's the question. Is the record that's there the or not? That's yeah. the story. Yeah. yeah. But is the record there? I mean, yeah. It could be that they have I, I don't know. I have it no could idea. be that it is created, but they're telling you that it's not created. What I run into is they won't give it to you until it's approved by the, the chief or the sheriff. Right. And it's not. Now, and I'm assuming you guys have had, is this the, is this the SO, the PD vote? 
This is this is city. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm assuming you've had that conversation with the chief. Yep. Chief and recently got fired. <laughs> oh, you got fired. <laughs> That's a whole other thing. Everybody gets stories about that. Yeah. Whole other thing. Um, we've got a new interim chief right now, and we're hoping to make some headway with a new publisher as well. Well, and, 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 and the other thing is, is it, it is reach out to, to me, to Holland. Ask us to comment for an article or to pick up the telephone or, or send a letter and say, hey, we understand that the, that the Times is having some difficulty here. What's up with that? Now, let me talk, talk very quickly. And I know nobody's brought this up yet, but it, it, it's interesting to me. Anybody had trouble? with the new mugshot bill. Basically, uh, the, the mugshot bill says that you have to sign a piece of paper or send a letter that tells local law enforcement that you're not going to misuse their mugshot. Now, I will tell you that I think the mugshot is a public record and that it is a dangerous, slippery slope to put any kind of restrictions on what can or cannot be done with the public record or that you should have to tell government why you want anything. What's misuse mean exactly? Well, it was targeted, that you're not going to sell it. It was targeted towards the to mugshots about sites yeah. where they uh, charge people to take uh, the now, mugshot off the and Now, I'm going to tell you all this, is that I, I was a part of the lobby to lobby for the mugshot bill. And I don't like the bill. But let me tell you what the original bill said. The original bill that Representative Strachan uh, passed the committee said that mugshots were exempt from the open records. The affidavit, the statement, was a compromise. It's not a compromise that, that I'm personally comfortable with because I think it's a slippery slope anytime we put additional and further restrictions on the Open Records Act. But we still at least do have access to mugshots. So I guess a more targeted question that I'm asking you is, has anybody been denied a mugshot since the mugshot bill was passed? We, the way they did it in the limit is, and I don't know how it is for the average show, but the way they did it in the limit is we, me and him and whoever might write a crime story sign one piece of paper and got a password for right. the so that, I, I think we have to resign the paper every year. Right, and that's going to be my recommendation uh, to you guys is that you have a, a relationship with SO with PD with with whoever maintains those mugshots to have a letter or statement on file. Uh, it it can if you have an adversarial relationship they could theoretically tell you that every single time you want a mugshot that you've got to go in and file. And, and I'd hate to see that happen. And, um, <coughs> it, it, you know, I hate those mugshot.com. Uh, they're extortions. You know, they, they, what they tell you is you, you get arrested for, for something. Maybe it's a, a DUI or whatever, but, you know, it, let, let's say it gets thrown out. Or, um, you know, maybe there is a conviction, but it's there on their site through perpetuity. I mean, it, it, it's there forever unless you call them and say, take my mugshot down, and their answer is, sure, we'll take your mugshot off of there. We don't want everybody looking at your face every time you, you apply for a job. We just need $400. And of course, they have sister sites, affiliate mugshot.org or whatever. Right, and once, so it's, it's, like up, and once it's up, it's up, it's up. So uh, I'm not comfortable <coughs> with the bill that was passed, but I will tell you, it is preferable to the bill that was proposed. Why can't the law say you can't extort people with their mugshot? Well, that was the law that they actually passed in 2012 or 13, oh, really? and they found out that they were having difficulty enforcing it basically because, and I know this is going to sound simplistic and funny, they couldn't find mugshots.com anywhere. Yeah. deals with an open records issue I've got where the government is sort of doing this. Uh, if they find some juvenile who is arrested and maybe dismissed uh, and any sort of charge, it appears that he then goes into the gang, the criminal gang database. Uh, we just had three young men convicted for life uh, because they were part of a criminal gang 
and the gang we were a part of was a rap group called yeah. Rita. Yeah. So I, and I started trying to get into it and information requests. How do you know these guys are in a criminal gang? Well, somebody said it, or oh, we saw a mugshot or something. Uh, except they're not being that definitive. Right. It turns out that they get a larger grant from the feds if they have more more people in the criminal database, yeah. or they do better when they prosecute. Yeah. So we're getting into their pockets now, and that's where we try and get open record requests turn into some real problems. Yeah, and I don't know if any of you, if any of you crime reporters have much experience with that or not. I've heard very cursory conversations about that. And, um, in fact, I talked with a, a, a police chief the other day about how broadly the word gang is being interpreted. Well, the, the statute in the code talks about criminal street gang, criminal street gang terrorism. And so these three young men, the indictment went out with the jury and had terrorists in the, the bill of materials seven times for each of them. Yeah. So they, you know, these are... Thank Homeland Security. Yeah. You know, well, I, I agree with that. That's a very frustrating thing. I don't know that I've got an answer or a call. Okay, what, who haven't we heard from? Uh, my, just been waiting. Right. my situation is a little different from all these. Uh, it's not a problem with open government, but a uh, dishonest uh, elected official. Imagine uh, that. Yeah, I know. It's one of the <laughs> uh, I'm Bobby Gerhard. I'm from Macon. I was the former uh, chief appraiser down in Glenn County, which is Brunswick St. Simons. Uh, on my way out, I suspected that there was a problem with homesteads down there. And I thought that there might be maybe 100 or 200 that were done incorrectly. Uh, it turns out there's 6,000 mm -hmm. out of the 18,000 homesteads. Uh, basically, Glenn County is overcharging those taxpayers uh, money for ad valorem taxes. And basically, uh, I sent all that information to a local attorney. They had a lawsuit. Uh, the local judges recused themselves. The judge from Atlanta came down to hear the class action argument. And that was over a year and a half ago. Uh, he hasn't decided yet. Meanwhile, the three-year statute on recovering ad valorem taxation overpayments due to a factual error is running. Uh, the taxpayers are losing homes because they're having to overpay on their taxes and other problems. But uh, in essence, I evoke my uh, fifth estate uh, right. Uh, I know y'all are familiar with the fourth estate, but the first, first three are clergy, nobility, commons, fourth estate, media. The fifth estate is now being called the bloggers or like social this media. <laughs> but that's what that's what they're saying. So in essence, I put up a website, uh, glencountyhomesteads.com, had all my spreadsheets on it, uh, get a lot of activity. People are, are going to it and finding out they're being cheated. Right. Uh, they're going to the tax commissioner's office and complaining and she says that her records are correct. That, uh, and, and she's partially telling the truth because she's relying on a data entry person that was in the tax assessor's office who used the wrong base year. So we have this problem of she's stonewalling until she gets out of office in 2016. Right. Meanwhile, these people are Overpaying since 2001, it's over. I, I quit figuring in 2012, and it was 11 million dollars. Uh, it's probably close to 15 million now. How many? Uh, I, I want to talk a lot about this. How many homeowners you say affected? <coughs> it's 6,000 out of 18. And how many of those have networked with you and are following the, the we're, site? We're getting, involved we're getting probably 500 a day going to the website. Okay, let, let me tell you something first of all in front of you. You're doing exactly what we're talking about. And it is an open government issue. And, and you are building the network. I mean, honestly, this is a real testimony to everything that, that we've been talking about. Now, I don't know, and, and I, I don't know what the, what the legal triggers are here. I don't know if this is in the court system now, how that affects the, the clicking time clock. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm not going to be able to talk about that. I, and, you know, without more information, I don't know, you know, if Holly's going to have more information about that. But you are doing the very kind of thing that we're talking about by raising awareness. I would like to think that local media will pick up on this and, and, and attack it and, 
and help drive that exposure. But this is real advocacy. This is real citizen action and advocacy. It's not just crowing. It's addressing an issue and being very fact-based in the way that it's being addressed and growing a network of citizens <coughs> to, to, to actually look for a remedy for, for what the situation is. I'll also be interested in, did, did, a, did a lawyer take this up pro bono? Oh, of course not. <laughs> but uh, I talked to uh, the attorney for the county that's handling it, uh, and basically after a year and a half, I said, hey, what's going on? And he said that this will, it doesn't matter who uh, loses, that's conflicting law on uh, right. class action in Avalor taxation. Uh, so he said that it doesn't matter whoever loses this first uh, class action argument, the other side will appeal until hell freezes over. So that's when I said, well, you know, I've got to, I've got to do something else besides just turn it over to an attorney. Right. And so that's when I did the website. And so they are at least getting their demand letters for the refund in before the three year lapses. Right. And, but they're still being told that the tax commissioner's office records are correct. Right. But, but you're, you're, you're preaching. You're, you're constantly yeah. telling and I know you've I'm got to get your, you've I'm got to get your demand letters in. This is the deadline to get your demand letters in. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, now, so far as the legal fees, who's paying the bill? Well, the, the attorney uh, is using a test case, and I don't think there are any fees being paid. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sitting at a, at a, at a restaurant uh, at lunch, and um, the bartender friend of mine always introduced me as the most hated man in Glen County. And so the guy sitting next to me, he said, well, what exactly do you do? I said, well, I'm chief appraiser. He said, well, I had, uh, I bought a house in those six. Uh, my taxes, I figured should be 1500 and they turned out to be almost double. I said, well, they gave you the wrong base year. And so uh, when I was on my way out, I ran into some local politicians down there, just like I did in Good County. And, uh, and so I started researching, and it took me three months to go through the records to get those 6,000. But I know that they're being cheated. And so this is my only remedy that I know of. And, and, and your name's on the ballot for BLC chair? Yeah. Uh, no, 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 I'm totally out of it. <laughs> no, no way ever again. Right. I think, I think Obi had some thoughts here. How can there be that much of a disconnect? My God, that's just astounding. It, it is astounding. Um, because well, in the management class, uh, you can you can delegate authority, but you can't delegate responsibility. Yeah. The tax commissioner obviously delegated the authority to the data processor in the tax assessor's office to come up with the right bag and tell them what it is. This exact same thing the, is happening in Union County. Oh, is that right? I'd okay. like to talk to you after no, okay. no, this. This is, a floating, <laughs> this is a floating homestead, the Scarlet Williams Amendment in Glen County. And if you're not familiar with floating homestead, uh, once you apply for your homestead, say, in 2012, then it's based on the value in 2011. That value is capped. The millage rate can change, so it's a floating homestead. So basically, it was done incorrectly on about 10% of the original ones in 2001, and then about 50% of the ones after that. And the reason why is because we would revalue about 50% of the county every year because of the sales activity. So we, to comply with the uh, Department of Revenue guidelines, we have to revalue uh, either the hot spot or cold spot, bring the values down or bring the values up. So evidently the data processor was putting in the current year instead of the prior base year. And no one ever caught it. Right. And when- and probably uh, in the beginning a very, very honest- it, Absolutely. But then when I have a taxpayer complain about that to me, I would send them, I think correctly, to the tax commissioner's office because they handle homestead. She would have a hissy fit and say that her records are correct and say go back to the tax assessor. So the taxpayer was being ping ponged back and forth. And finally they just give up. And, and I'm talking about uh, the people in this group are unbelievable. One of the ta one of the board of commissioners is in it, the head of IT, the assistant county administrator, 
the number two person in HR, Sam Nunn, uh, Davis Love's brother, wow. uh, Steve Melnick, who's a friend of mine, he's a golfer, he's been cheated out of $3,400 a year, uh, and on and on and on. And these people had no idea this was going on. <clears throat> isn't there, Holly, I'll ask you, isn't there a thing in the, in the code section 45-whatever, which is tax law, that if over 5% of the people appeal their values, the whole digest stops? There's yeah, something, it, it, there's something it's, to it's, that effect. Yes, yeah, uh, 3%, but... I think it's 5% of the people, and if they appeal, I think it happened in Bibb County. I'm sure it happened it, in Hall it County. Everywhere. It happened in Hall County one year, several years ago, yeah. and the whole digest stops. They can't collect taxes. They can't send out tax bills, and then everything has to be done. And maybe if you've got six thousand things, everybody no, appeal, it'll stop. Right, but this is not an appeal. This is this is uh, posted. Uh, still, if they appeal their values and all, right. it, this it is stops. No, but it's not. I, I understand what you're saying, but uh, this is not this, property appraisal. This this, this is, is based on property appraisal, yeah. but uh, this but is history. History. This is history. This is the current value change, and that's when you appeal the 45-day period. Why couldn't you go ahead and file an appeal on that anyway? You could. For, well, because you're being charged this year. Okay. Uh, this is after this is after their 45-day. Uh, Appeal period has expired. Right, because it had to appeal by April the first or Whenever, something. Four or five days from the yeah. date of the. But they can start. They the, can start January first if all these people go in and appeal for they next year. Stop. The whole the digest months. is going to stop. But, but believe me, but they'll change brother, something. You can get a, you, a county can get around. You don't. The digest doesn't right. just but stop. You can, relative to our discussion, what this is about. That, that's why you're here. Is is that there was some darkness and somebody shines some light on. It really doesn't matter who's shining that light. In this case, it was just somebody that happened to be in the know. Somebody that, honestly, kind of an insider. There are a lot of whistleblowers out there, but it's up to you to find them. And to let them know that they do have a voice. It's not always going to be the local newspaper. I will tell you, it ought to be the local newspaper. But I can't promise you that because too many of them won't do the work. Or for whatever reasons, political or otherwise, they've been told not to do the work. But nobody's restricting you to being the light shiners. I'm just curious how many of us are from local newspapers. Yeah, again, again, everybody that's a newspaper person. We had more this morning than this afternoon. We must have. I told I told my group. Hey, I told the, uh, my group at lunch that I defended uh, lawyers, government <laughs> officials, and newspapers. So if there's anybody I've left out, please let me know. Okay, but who wants to take us in a different direction? Other experiences. I just want to oh, add. Yeah, I, I missed you a minute ago. I just want to add one comment to what he said. Amongst the many hats I wear, I'm a tax rep. I go get your property values lowered. And there's some counties I go in, I literally get taken to court by the county because I get the values lowered so much. But what all of you need to do is go get comps in your neighborhoods and you'll find out that 99% of you are 30% overvalued. And some worse. your best friend in that. Yeah. Well, and you know a lot of y'all talk about yeah. being, being public enemy number one in your counties. And you may be publicly public enemy number one with members of the board of commission, with members of city council, with people in the tax assessment <laughs> but not with ordinary everyday folks that are trying to make ends meet, that are paying their taxes, that are worried about the security of dark lit parking lots in the college campus at night. You know, we have got to do what we do, and I firmly believe this for the right motivations, for the right reason. And motivation does matter a whole lot. For those of you that are in the newspaper business, if you think that we are open government advocates so we can say, gotcha. And the thing I hate to hear more than anything is people say, yeah, well, y'all are just trying to sell a newspaper. Really? We honestly, we can't make a living 50 cents at a time or a dollar at a time. It just doesn't work that way. So I've had a lot of reporters come to me sort of 
they get real frustrated. They say, you know, nobody likes me, or they're talking about me, or I'm taking the heat, or people are checking. If you can sleep at night, that means if you did it for the right reasons, if your interest was about democracy, about freedom, about citizens, about taxpayers, you don't have to worry about what people are saying about you. Because I guarantee you, you're, you have far more support than you do have enemies. But do make sure that this is about the right thing and not about winning. Who else? I'd like to hear from some of the people in Cobb. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Gary. Well, well y'all have been at the centerpiece of this issue for a good while now. Yeah, I, uh, looking on the positive side, uh, the greatest thing that's happened with the Braves moving to Cobb has been the AJC. I have never been a, a fan of the AJC uh, for lots of reasons, but this young man, Dan Kleppel, has, has shown me and shown the world, I hope, just exactly how important the free press is and how he manages to get a full page uh, on a Sunday edition twice now uh, is beyond me. But that's, if, if you need any fortification for what you're talking about here today, that's it. Uh, the uh, recovery of data, the open records issue, is sort of interesting because the last big kerfuffle we had is that uh, our chairman chose to start off this whole thing by talking to a, uh, a sort of a uh, street vendor kind of lawyer. I mean, a very powerful bond lawyer, but he had nothing to do with government. What he had to do with was how to get around the Constitution and do whatever it is you want to do without going to the people. Uh, and our chairman kept saying to Dan Kleppel, no, we, he never was a lawyer. And Kleppel said, well, gee, I got 17 different versions of this document, and he prepared the first five, and his firm's name is in there. Well, he didn't have authority to do that. He never worked for us. Uh, and the last full page blurb that Dan got in the General Constitution was a result of uh, the lawyer in question who had lost a $4 million fee for his company over the next few years uh, had chosen to take an email which he got from the Cobb Chamber of Commerce to his office saying, Chairman Lee says, you're, you're our lawyer. Uh, and that was never disclosed in open records because it wasn't an open record. It came from the Chamber of Commerce to the attorney. So one of the really smart things this very smart attorney did was one day after the article came out, he simply sent it, he forwarded that article with no preamble or anything to several government accounts. The Cobb County lawyer, the Cobb County chairman, the Cobb County, and now they were part of the open records and they had to be produced. And so the lid is blown off. I, so, I was looking at uh, a uh, open records case, I guess it was yesterday, the day before yesterday, where a uh, city councilman was writing emails to a member of the downtown development authority saying how careful he was not to put anything in email. And there were a litany of emails <laughs> and things that he had said that, that compromised his uh, ethics with respect to the city. So, you know, a lot of times people will they'll say the right things in one breath but then end up and make the most stupid mistakes. And, and I, I will tell you, the ability to be able to access email is huge. And, and uh, being able to, to look at cell phone records and uh, cell phone messages is huge because it's amazing that people that ought to know, and they'll just put it on government email. They don't even think about it. They'll just send the email. So it's amazing the, the things that are out there and things that are available. Um, you know, if you take the opportunity to access it. Until you start asking for it, then they get smart. Yeah, yeah. If I could uh, mention one thing that you, I didn't have to ask for. Uh, we have an online agenda for the commissioners, and then they have their meetings, and then the minutes are approved, and the minutes go into another file online. Uh, 
uh, it turns out that this MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, was the first disclosure document, and it was full of a lot of junk. Uh, but there was a very essential change made between the time it was presented to the public and the time it was approved. And that change dealt with the intergovernmental relationships, which is how you get around the Constitution. Uh, the, the Cobb Marietta Coliseum Authority wanted no financial responsibility, but that was who the county was going to have to make their agreement with in order to go through these shenanigans, this little shell game. Uh, two days before the vote, the Marietta Coliseum Authority said, we have to have this sentence put in the MOU, which basically said Cobb County agrees to be responsible fiscally for anything that we do in this. Uh, and the email which we got through open records said, Chairman Lee agrees with this. So then they come to the vote and the chairman says, well, now this is a modified thing. And pink pages or something we really ought to talk to Sam Owens about. <laughs> but uh, he talked about two incidental changes, one having to do with a cap on the annual maintenance and the other one having to do with a, a rail into uh, the stadium. He says, those are the two changes, but I want you to know it's a changed document. He very carefully did not mention this uh, global change to the intergovernmental agreement and got him to pass. Then it turns out, about two weeks later, I'm fumbling around online and I look at the agenda because I want to look at the copy of this MOU to make sure my recollection is right that that wasn't in there. And son of a gun, it's in there now. Uh, gee, it wasn't in the agenda. I pull out my copy. It turns out they had gone in and changed, and never not just the minutes, the but changed the agenda to show that it was the way they wound up approving it. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had a friend who happened to have an active ethics complaint going against Chairman Lee. <laughs> I called him about this an hour before the close of business on Thursday before Good Friday. He amended his ethics complaint to include the fact that they had changed the agenda to show the finalized item, the fraudulent right. change. That was an hour before the county closed for Good Friday and Easter Monday and all that stuff. Sometime between then and Sunday, when I looked at it, Easter Sunday, they had gotten word of it because he had filed his complaint. They had gone back in and undone it all again. <laughs> uh, and I started saying, you know, they learned nothing from Nixon. It's the power up to, to get you. Uh, but that's the fact. That's still sitting there. Uh, I went to the DA with it. Uh, he got an affidavit from somebody that says, no, it didn't happen. But you've got the documents. I'm sorry? But, but you've got printouts of both. I've got the documents. I've been trying to go to the grand jury for four months now and been frozen out. So I'm but still trying another to do that. great example of what Watchdoggy does just by paying attention. And even though you may have just been going on to do some cursory reading, it was there. Uh, I think we had something. In, yeah. Um, my question was so sort of about the email thing. Um, we've had people write to the school board members at their school board address and get answer back from a Gmail account, which then is not open records. Yes, yes, yes. No, that's right. So it doesn't matter what the um, where, what address, private home, whatever, as long as it's dealing with the public business, it's subject to release under the Open Records Act. Well, Clear, unsettled so, so how? They just how, don't do it, though. With this Chamber of Commerce, they... Well, well how yeah. would you get it, though? Because if you ask the school board and you say, we want to have the email between school board it's on their server. X and Y, it's not on their server. It it's came to a private email. Gmail. 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 email yes, but it came to a government address, is what it, you're no, saying. No, no. Uh, as a citizen, a citizen mailed to the school board member at their school county address. The school county board member didn't answer from that address, nor did they copy that address. They answered I, the citizen from a Gmail account. And I can't answer the mechanics. I'm not that tech savvy, but what I'm telling you is if we brought that case, we would win. That is subject to release under the open records law. Okay, but the case, my case was not the chairman sending this message on the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce, I understand. Just ask it. Just ask them for it. The school board member. Not even going out. They just want. They just want. They just say no. We won't. They just say no. We won't. So maybe I take that one as a private case. 
Well, I, I, I can show you um, 10,000 pages of documents, seriously. And I, I had a stack this high in front of Shirley before they got her. That's what we were talking about. All of her personal emails where she was doing all of this stuff that the FBI had. And I said, Shirley, I've got all this. And that's when she started crying saying, oh, well, I never should have run for office. And I'm thinking everybody would have been better off if you hadn't. <laughs> but she were, and all of the other commissions, it's not just Shirley. They've all told me that. And I've got the emails from the other side where it came in. So I have copies of it. So I'm requesting what I already have in hand. And they refuse. They just refuse. Um, I can tell you what the law is. I know. I can see that it isn't regarding. When that is different. Well, certainly <laughs> my favorite case for the kind of attorney fees being paid uh, for bringing that challenge. But, I mean, um, that, that's, um, I would say you, anybody wants to let you that one, where and when, from, with email is sent, you got a winner on your hand, and I could probably learn you, I probably I shouldn't do it, but a couple of lawyers would be interested in that case. That's, I mean, there isn't such thing as a slam dunk, as Gary and I know, young lawyers think they're a slam dunk, so that's a... Um, right, well, and in, in all honesty, it would only be fair to let you know what happened with my open records lawsuit before anybody would consider that, because then they'd probably run. <laughs> It, it probably would yeah, not be me. worthwhile, seriously. I mean, give me, but that, regardless of whether it's your case, and I think it's a really fascinating issue, it's <laughs> something that I have wrestled with all the time, where people, I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a smart tactic, I'd say, on some public officials' right. part to try to avoid the Open Records Act by doing that, and just in the law. Well, that's actually how I started. I got all of the emails from everybody else so that I could prove it, and then they refused it. And I really think you will see the courts consistently saying attempts to circumvent the law is a violation of the law. And, you know, so the point is, were they doing government business? Could, you know, could you get the evidence to bring the case? You know, there, there are a lot of questions there, but it is a record. And Well, my own state senator is on record saying that no one will ever win a, an open records lawsuit in Gwinnett, and she won't deny saying that, Renee Unterman. Oh, I'm worried I know you're going to say that. <laughs> um, she really could, some one of my colleagues is going to get amped up with statements like that. Yeah. I'll send you a transcript of my last meeting with her. I can give you a, wor a verbatim transcript of my last meeting with her. Uh-oh, we're in the wire. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, we're, we're getting closer and closer to uh, deadline, which all you newspaper folks understand. So, uh, does anybody have sort of anything completely different or new or unrelated to these other topics that we talked about that we've not had a chance to? Yeah. Quick, From Gainesville. Quick, easy question. When you request documents, can they redact cell phone numbers? I was going to ask that. Did the cell phone number of exception pass? There was, there was legislation. Um, I didn't think it passed. Yeah, I can't remember. Um, would you email me and I'll look it up for you? Well, that's they redact all the on incident reports. All personal identifying all information. All personal emails. Yeah. Email. I have, I there, was, is also there was a person. bill, there was yeah. a bill um, brought to redact cell phone numbers. Um, and I can't remember if it passed, but if you email me, I'll look it up. I'll send you the bill number and whether it passed, and you can use that in your reporting. And then another quick question. Um, I think I was reading in the blue book, like, when you've got an investigation, obviously it's open investigation, you can't get stuff. If it's an unsolved murder, and it's two or three years later, they're not doing anything on it, this is open. I tell you, it's, 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 yeah, they say it's not. It's really funny. Good. So this book is sort of, um, yeah. you know, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, this is probably my pride and joy. <laughs> um, I envision this book as it would all be, and I went to law enforcement and I said, I think we're going to have this whole book be about pending investigation, etc. Because every Everybody in the state interprets it different. Is it a habeas appeal? Does that one close? Is it after the and law enforcement all said to me, oh no, it's very clear what a pending investigation is. I 
think that that's a closed investigation. You are going to have law enforcement officers around the state argue to you they are blue in the face that an investigation is open forever. I would take the tightest, most narrow view and just say, and um, oh, he's right, I think it's better help, right? Because in the past few years, they've tried to work on the temporal limits. I think it's closed as soon as possible. But there is a very hard line position that they're going to be open. They're never solved. They're open forever. To give, to give context to that situation, uh, I talked to the law enforcement officer in our county, uh, their PIO. Uh, she told me, just in person, I didn't get it in writing, that they said that they were not going to be open, opening that case or looking at that case at that point, because it was coming up on an anniversary of something to write something. And uh, then after that, I was trying to file a records request with the custodian. The custodian then sent back, sorry, we can't support us at that point. You know, quoted the, the case law back at me. I quoted the case law back at her. And, uh, <laughs> that was perfect. and then, yeah, well, yeah. And then, uh, and then I got a very, very terse email back that just said, oh, well, GBI is on it. So uh, it's still active. Yeah. Even, yeah. So that's just kind of where it is at this point. I don't, I don't really so. have a good answer. I just, I personally, and I'd say most media and we go from that because we take the position that it's, it's closed almost once they leave it alone, but they're always going to pull a stunt like that. So I don't know if I have any good ways to get around it other than finding a sympathetic law enforcement officer. Do you just got a VOIP voice system, which means it just occurred to me. You've got a VoIP system that the messages are being recorded because you get it forwarded to you as an email. Will that be cooked by open record? Wait, okay. Can you say it? And a voice over protocol call system. Okay. Your phone calls are being recorded because then the message can be forwarded to you as a sound file, which means sure. they're recorded. Sure. So, but the fact it's not, if they don't forward you that email, you still know they're being recorded. Yeah. And if it's on public, if it's a public servant, will that be covered by open record? I'd say so. I'd say so. Yeah. I think that's like her Two reporters. Don't say anything you don't want in person permission. <laughs> somebody to find out. That doesn't matter for that kind of right. system. Yeah. This is a communication system right. paid for by government money. Yeah, yeah. I, I, okay. I think I think in most cases it'd be viewed as a record. Okay, I know that we still have a lot more. We got you know a smattering of hands throughout the room. Well, we are going to wrap up. We'll try to stay around as much as we can. But here's what I want to do. Uh, I'm going to ask each one of our panelists to give you one takeaway as they look at this and, and, and uh, think about uh, what you can do or what one thing that you might need to know to go home with. Uh, what would that be? So we'll just we'll, uh, uh, start again. Right, I'll tell you what I would do as a takeaway from this. I want you to be cognizant as Orders of what your middle level administrators are going through because they're getting pressure from both sides. I've been both a low level administrator of BSU and I've been a faculty member and done all sorts of things and managed not to get run out in 25 years, which is semi miraculous, I would tell you right now. For some of the things that we have covered. Um, so your government officials would not have been showing up today if they didn't care about what they're doing. Okay. So occasionally, you need to ask them why something is not going to listen to the case about why the minutes are not up. Ask first. And then if something as simple as the draft or get the tape recording would have solved it, um, ask. And this is what I tell my students when they're talking to the VHU administrators. This is the very last thing we want to do is to have to file an open records request. It's the very last thing we ever want to do. We need to get the folks to talk to us. Um, and what we have discovered, what has really worked at the university level, is social media. So we're working on a story right now about um, overcrowding on the bus system. Um, and I'm assuming DOT would do the regulatories on the buses, where they have too many students on these buses. They're in front of the little white line that you're not supposed to stand in front of. And the administration is saying, no, they're not overcrowded. We never turned anyone away. And she's telling me this. I said, how do you know? She says, I'm looking at the database. I said, bingo, thank you. Um, so what we've done with social media is we have these kids tweeting. I said, OK, I'm on the bus. There's no, we can't get seats. Here's people, here's our photos. Somebody's standing in front of the white line. Here you go. And that's making the administration respond. 
And that the use of social media to get authorities to respond is probably the, the second takeaway. I know I have one. I'm a professor. <laughs> yes, yes. So second takeaway I would get social media. But, li but listen to the folks on the other side. They have a story to tell you. I don't simply assume they're doing stuff simply because they're rotten people. That's 99.9% .9 of the time not the case. Okay. Oh. Mine's a little bit simpler, but you're the, the academic. I would say, <laughs> I would say keep going, even when you get the, the no and the pushback from the public agency. I, I have to say that I, you all shame me. I mean, I put a lot of time and professional energy into this, but the work um, that you guys are doing is amazing. So I would say keep going, keep doing, keep fighting the good fight, because um, I'm, I'm impressed by everything I've heard today, so thank you all. Okay. Yeah, I just, I, I try to have a, a, a low threshold of indignation. Well, I, try to, <laughs> well, I try to temper it. Here, here is my problem. Here is my problem. And I want Denise to hear this too. There is a galaxy, just a, a, with all of y'all, there is a, um, Bobby, I won't say how to you play on too. There is just a galaxy of stuff out there that I so much want to report on, write about, and we do not have the, we do not have 12, 1300 people like the New York Times. We have a constant, constant, constant picking and choosing where you're going to weigh in on, what you're going to do, what you're going to tackle. I, have, I just got back to my desk to find <laughs> an answer to an open record, but it's right there. I mean, so don't, don't. Be smart about what you what you go after, what you tackle. And remember that there are there is a network. There are other people out there who have dealt with what you're dealing with, are going to do what you do. There are experts out there. Don't feel like you're, you know, in a vacuum. There there is help out there. Other other writers, other reporters, listserv or whatever, there are other people out there who can help. But CBS did, and I was just thinking, why couldn't the Telegraph at well, least? Well, we have written about your case, and I want to talk to you before, before, okay. before. I guess. Anyway, right. um, I want to talk too much. There you go. Uh, to kind of piggyback on what I was saying, I had a, a real good friend that uh, actually was an ombudsman for open meetings and open records in Tennessee, and she just uh, left the state comptroller's office and uh, is going on to different kinds of advocacy, but. Uh, all of you uh, Second Amendment folks will understand this. She said, we need to be using a rifle with a scope instead of a shotgun. So it always helps to be very targeted in what you're doing, to be very specific, to deal with one issue at a time. Don't make everything this scattergun approach, trying to solve all the world's woes in one fell swoop. If you have a records request, be very targeted, be very specific, know what you want. It's always better to know what you want and what you're going to get before you get it. Uh, you'll hear people say it's always best to not ask a question if you don't know the answer. Well, be very specific about what you're looking at. And when you confront public officials, and you should, and we all should, and newspapers should, let's know exactly what it is. Let's do our homework as we go into it. Here are my other takeaways. You've already got them. First of all, understand that, uh, and please go home. In your newspaper, uh, on your blogs, uh, on your websites, and make sure that all local officials understand that there is never a requirement for them to go behind closed doors, to go to the back room, that they are not required to do executive session. Every time they do it, it is a choice. Number two, there is absolutely no prohibition that would prohibit a county, a city official, a school board member, member for speaking their mind, for expressing their point of view, or for disclosing information, as long as it is not proprietary, information for personal gain. That's all the ethics code is going to pro prohibit them from saying. They can tell you what happens. And then finally, there is no protection afforded public officials just because they know, have heard of, or believe that attorneys exist in war. I want to thank, uh, go ahead. And, and we may be one of the few couple of government employees still in the room at this stage. And, and again, we thank you very much for being a part of this. And we're delighted to be here, even though it's it's not necessarily everything has been so relatable to us. Right. But let me let me just say this, because we have an extremely aggressive taxpayer tax 
tax dog group in our county. All of y'all probably know Mary Patrick, and I'm not saying anything I haven't said to her one-on-one -on -one in either Facebook, blog, email, phone, person to person. Um, I'm our 10th county manager in 11 years because they're just run off. We get hundreds of open records requests a year from Mary alone, let alone all the other entities that, you know, ask for things or other citizens that ask for things. And that may not sound like a lot because I think we're mostly surrounded by big entities in here and we're little. But it's a lot. And we have work to do. We have bills to pay, employees to pay, calls to return, citizens to help. And so it's a lot of burden on us to do it. And, and we fundamentally believe in um, open government, we're citizens too. We, we would want to know what's going on. Um, but what you're saying is right. It can't be this shotgun approach where you beat us up for everything all the time. You know, if the agenda isn't perfect, if the time at the top says six, but down below it says the work session is at 5.15, don't beat us up for everything because we're not robots. Um, and and, you know, we get asked for all the personnel records, all the check registers, all the checks, all the minutes, all the... Everything we produce is asked for by our watchdog group. And so what we've tried to do is shove as much as we can onto our website, which is antiquated at best. Um, and so it doesn't quite do the job. But if you don't want to have this adversarial relationship between your... your advocate groups, and I'm not against that in any way. I've worked with citizen advocates everywhere I've ever been, and your government, I think that's where we are. Right. Don't let it get to that. Right. Well, Because you won't have a good government. You right. won't have people running for office that are good folks that would do a good job, because they don't want to fool with it. And you have students. employees that want to come to work for the government right. for the same reason. And the specific dynamics of, uh, of this case, we're not going to be able to <coughs> vet out and solve no, and have an iron no. out today. But I will tell you all this, is that everybody, government, every citizen, every media representative, every watchdog group needs to understand that we are the government. We are a self-governed people. Mm -hmm. And so that everything that government has and government does is ours and your citizens as well. So that's the culture that we're talking about and, and the mindset that we want to help you. And it drives more. up costs if we're just cranking out open records requests. And we're paying and we're paying for the cost as well. But, but so but and, it's, again, but it's okay, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up, guys. I've, I've got a five-second tip that will boost. Okay. Oh, oh, this applies to newspapers, blogs, whatever. Social media, absolutely correct. But social media isn't simply Facebook and Twitter. If you're not a power Reddit user, if you don't have Instagram, if you don't have Tumblr, you're not reaching the younger generation. So make sure you, you use Reddit especially. And that does go viral. I had a story on Andrew Hunt. I had over 100,000 people visit from because they got upvoted on Reddit. Cool. So use Reddit for your blogs, your newspapers, right. please. Right. Again, all of you have... Uh, an immense amount of resource and information and I hope at least that for those of you that are doing very similar kind of things in your community you're walking away with the value of having a larger network now where you can share information and share ideas I know that Holly and I uh, not only talk about uh, transparency and openness and access we practice it too so you always have unfettered access to whatever uh, resources that we can help bring to bear uh, we're always willing to look at maybe uh, commenting uh, for your sites or for your publications if you would like that or writing a letter or picking up a telephone call. Uh, we'll do our best to, to provide a resource and tool there as well. You, you have my email address. Uh, you have uh, on both of our sites, on the transparency site, uh, on the freedom of information or the, the foundation site, uh, you've got full access. Uh, to get in touch with us multiple ways. And so we hope that you continue to talk to one another, you continue to talk to us. Let me encourage you uh, to uh, get on our sites, to get on uh, our blog, to get on to our Facebook and social media sites and share information with us and be a part of that and grow this culture statewide. We're going to continue to 
uh, do these sessions. Uh, what I would like for y'all to do is, is a homework assignment, is go back and zip me or Holly an email and let us know what you would like to see in the next workshops that we do, where you would like to see them at as we move them around the state, and uh, maybe you can even help provide a venue. And I will tell you this, if you can get an entire uh, county and city government to come together and do an open government session, or that we can help mediate a conversation between watchdog groups and government, those are all the kinds of things that we think will bring value to help create this environment. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for being a part of the discussion. Hang around, network with each other, uh, talk with us. All the materials that we have left are still for you. Don't think that it's just you, you got one, you can't get any more. If you've got people that you want to take books back to, we've got more. In fact, we've got truckloads of more. So uh, if you want the, the uh, law enforcement book, uh, if you want the red book, uh, the cards, all that, the papers, all that information is free available to you. And again, thank you all for being here.